Hello everyone and welcome to episode 5 of the ERAD Football Podcast. My name is Iconic EU, joined by my man Jakey here. What's going on guys? And today we will be doing, as per usual, we will be rounding off the fixtures for game week 4, was it? Uh, I can tell you, yeah, game week 4. Yeah, game week 4. And we'll kick it off straight away with um, Southampton versus Man United, which was the early kickoff on Saturday. Yep, we will. It wasn't a game I get to watch, so I can let you take the floor. Yes, I was able to watch this one. For me, um, Southampton played really well in this game. They were unlucky to come away with nothing. Um, Man United, for me, they... There was a lot of talk about um, them needing to still get a response again after the fantastic result against Liverpool. Um, and to be fair, United did okay. They they set up well. They frustrated Southampton. But it was one of those where Man United will favour better when they play teams that um, have the ball for large periods of time so they can play on the counter and just sit back. Southampton were fine to let Man United have the ball and they were only really having the ball in certain areas when the ball came to your explosive players like your Brunos, your Rashfords, your Sanchos. They they struggled to really make anything work because Southampton are at a strong knit back four um, and they really frustrated Man United and they did to Man United basically what uh, Man United did to Liverpool just without the the finishing touch to it unfortunately um i do want to give a shout out to that um center back bella Kotchap. he looks like an absolutely incredible signing for southampton yeah, I, I pointed that out i think he's going to be some player for he's a, he's a permanent sign as well isn't he I think he's yes gonna... I, I believe so and that ba- uh, bazunu from i think it's city that he signed from he looks a right talent yeah, he looks good as well, but that Bella Kotchap for me really stood out. Uh, like I say, Southampton did play well. They were stretching Man United. Um, che Adams was a force once again. He's, he's so, it's so crazy with Che Adams. He looks really small, but my God, can he battle against any centre-back? Like He gives any centre-back a right game, and you know you've been in a game against Che Adams. Um Lavia played well as well. James Ward-Prowse, as per usual, he was pinging balls left, right and centre. Um, but for me, there was just just a lack of cutting edge from Southampton. It's the only reason they came away with nothing from this game. Uh, I do have to give a shout out to Man United. They did obviously win one nil, and it was a, a very well-worked goal that opened the deadlock. Um, in the 55th minute, it was a good play down the right-hand side. Um, I believe it was a 1-2 with um, Rashford to Diogo Dallo on the overlap. And he um, pinged the ball into the box uh, absolutely perfectly onto Bruno's foot as he's running in, hits it first time straight into the bottom corner. It was a great finish from Bruno, um, just carrying on his good form without Cristiano Ronaldo in the team. It seems like he plays better without Cristiano in the team, carrying on that form from not last season, but the season before Ronaldo signed when he was the main man at Man United. And it seems like as well, with Ten Hag giving him the captaincy, that's really invigorated him and fired him up again. So that's good to see Hmm. uh, from a Man United perspective and also a football perspective as well, because Bruno is a talent. My only problem ever has ever been with Bruno Fernandes is he just needs to stay on his feet and stop moaning so much. His antics let him down for what a brilliant player he could be. What I will yeah, say as well, give yeah. props to the defence. There were a lot of question marks around uh, Lissandro Martinez and he's, while they were prevalent against Brighton and Brentford, the last two games that he's played, has really he's really excelled in them. He, he will excel in games where the, they don't, like a team doesn't play with a big number nine. You know, Che, che oh. Adams, like you say, isn't the, the smallest and we didn't that we started for me, you know, so he'll he'll find joy against teams that don't play the, the the long balls or don't have that target man in in the box. But yeah, he, he he's played well for the past two games. He's done really well. Oh yeah, def definitely did. And um, 
I mean, Man United fans also got to see their new signing Casemiro for 10 minutes, who came on for a langer. Um, for me, Ten Hag made the right subs at the right times as well. Um, after they took the lead, um, they was actually getting ready to bring on Cristiano Ronaldo right before they took the lead. And it looks, it, he probably would have come on for a langer at that point. But then they took the lead, so Ten Hag then switched it up and left it for a bit. And then brought Ronaldo on for Sancho, which was a bit surprising because I thought Sancho was actually decent when he got on the ball. But there wasn't really, like I say, Man United played well, but they didn't really threaten other than the goal they scored. There wasn't really much more for Bazunu to do. Yeah. It was a lot. It was a lot coming towards Man United side, and as you say, their defense did stand tall in this game. So, my last thoughts on this one is: props to Man United. You have to beat what's in front of you, and sometimes you have to grind out these results. Um, especially the way they started the season, they'll take this all day long, um, and they've shown that they have a fighting spirit about them. Because if this would have been game week one or two, they'd have probably lost three or four one. Yeah, um, definitely. But props to them. And also props to Southampton as well. Even though they come away with nothing, they did look good. They just didn't have that cutting edge um, on the day, which can happen sometimes. Even the top teams struggle sometimes to put the ball in the back of the net. If your goalkeeper's on fire in the opposition team or the defence is just having a blind eye, it can just happen like that. But unfortunate for Southampton, but well done to Man United. And that's two wins out of two for them. Yeah, 100%. And on we go to the first of the three o'clock kickoffs uh, this week, and it's Chelsea Leicester a game in which I think Chelsea were incredibly lucky, and Leicester can probably feel a bit aggrieved that they haven't come away with either a point or even the win after the, the early red card. Uh, do, do you want to add a bit, or do you want me to? Okay. Yes, so this game was absolutely crazy in terms of um, a neutral aspect. Uh, obviously, it was a three o'clock kickoff, so it wasn't live. But um, it seemed like, from what I was um, hearing on um, Gillette Soccer Saturday, that Leicester were dominating the early portions of the game, which led to Conor Gallagher getting uh, two bookings in six minutes, which is very unfortunate for the young man. He obviously wanted to come back to Chelsea to prove himself and it's not started off in the greatest way um, to his um, Chelsea career. But I'm sure he'll turn it around. These, these things happen. He was obviously trying to just get aggressive for Chelsea and just made two bad tackles. But um, so that put Chelsea in a hole right off the get go. And it, to be honest, it's, it's it's a surprising result in terms of obviously Chelsea winning with ten men, but it also doesn't surprise me at the same time because Leicester for me just they just look toothless right now. They're everyone knows that the their problems they're having. We spoke about it multiple times now. It's the same problems they're gonna keep having. They're just the lack of depth, lack of players, they're just they've got no spine for me anymore, they've got no leaders in the team. And that's why um, Chelsea were able to come out 2-1 winners, even with 10 men. They did get a consolation with Harvey Barnes, um, which is obviously good to see him still scoring. Um, Raheem Sterling getting two for Chelsea is great. Chelsea are going to need those goals if they don't end up signing a striker by the end of the window. Um, but yeah, it's one of those where it's unfortunate for Leicester and they will see it as points dropped completely because they're playing against 10 men for um, 62 Seven, minutes yeah. or so, 70 odd minutes. Um, but for me, they've just got no, no cutting edge right now, no leaders in the team. Um, and Chelsea have the bit between their teeth at the minute. Um Chelsea for me are a weird one. They they seem like they Tuchel seems like he has an idea of how he wants to play, but right now he doesn't have the players in order to play that way. If that makes sense, um, I think by the end of the window he might have the players to play the way he wants to play. Because for me, I think he wants to play five at the back, and for me, you need three good centre backs to be able to do that. Um, and currently, he only has two in um, Kulabali and. Um, 
um, Tiago Silva, sorry. Mm. But at the end of the day, um, you still have to beat what's in front of you. Um, and Chelsea did that. Uh, an- another win for them. Um, Leicester absolutely struggling right now. Um, like, like I said in the last episode, I hope they turn it around because they're a staple in the Premier League. But it just don't seem to have anything right now for me. I'll be very surprised if they pick up any points in August. Um, with obviously um, Man United coming up next. That's a very tough game for them because Man United are on a high, Leicester on a low, at Old Trafford as well. I don't see them picking up anything from that game, but you never know. This is the Premier League. Mm. But, one, yeah. One, one thing I'll add is, as well, I think Chelsea fans with the lack of goals, as much as Sterling did score two, he's, he's not going to be the, 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 the striker they need to score 20 this season. And they'll have to feel a bit, a bit annoyed when you see the player that you know you've let go, banging them mm. in for RB Leipzig again. And you, mm. you kind of have to sit there and think, well, why couldn't he do this with us? Um, yeah, I think it's just a bit. Uh, for me, I've never, because there's been a lot of players that have come from the German league and the Prem, and some have done well because they've had. The, team to do the manager behind them and the way they play, but it's just a completely different game in the German league. It's a yeah. lot slower. The teams play a lot higher line, so it's so much easier for Werner to get in behind. I don't think you can compare, really. But I oh, know I'm just saying. You, you, I, I imagine Chelsea fans can feel a bit can feel a bit aggrieved when they see their what was a a, a very expensive sign and banging them in for fun when he couldn't really find find the net with the chances that he had in this league. Oh, of course. But the same goes for any team. Even you yeah. look at my team with uh, Sebastian Haller. He even came out and said um, when he signed for um, Ajax, he said that um, that it, he, he, everyone obviously knew how good of a player he was and he knew he could score goals. We just didn't play the way he wanted to play. And then he goes to Ajax, a team that play the way he wanted to play and he scored goals for fun there so it's yeah. just it's, it's just the them. way it goes sometimes yeah but uh we will we'll move on to the next of the three o'clock kickoffs good and it's on to the second of the three o'clock kickoffs on saturday it's brighton versus leeds a very very good result for brighton taking them to fourth on the table yes absolutely um this also um was um i believe it was um the victory for them um we actually broke a club record for brighton on saturday um extended their unbeaten run in the league to nine league games which is a club record in the top flight to passing their eight match record in 1981 Got so that as a, as a brighton big, fan big big stuff that from brighton um this was probably um, as as we said, it was another three o'clock kickoff, so we didn't get to watch it. But it was probably a, a, a lot close, closer um, than some people expected. I mean, these are two teams that have started very strong. Um, before the game even kicked off, I could see it going either way. This one, um, but Brighton obviously came out with the one nil win um, in front of their home fans again, which is great to see. I think Leeds. Um, they're still on the right track for me. I don't see any problems with Leeds. They've been battling hard. They've made some very good signings. It seems like they've brought in players that just want to just fight for the club again. There's something they lost last season um, towards the end of it. But it wasn't. It was a, a game of very, very few chances, to be honest. Only six shots on goal between the two teams in the whole game. And obviously, it only needed one of them to hit the back of the net for Brighton. Yeah. Through Pascal Gross. Set he, he up by started, the yeah. Trossard. He, he started the season well. He had the two against United at the start of the season. And he's just carried on his goal-scoring form throughout. Yes, he has. And unfortunately for Brighton and Leeds fans, there isn't much else we can talk about this result. I mean, um, as stated, it puts Brighton up to fourth in the league, which is fantastic. Um, I don't think Leeds can worry about this result. It's just one of them. You know, you're playing a team that have started with a bit of rich vein, a vein of form. You know, you're going to a, a ground that's notoriously very, very hard to get points at. 
it's no matter yeah. which team you are, Bright, uh, Brighton Stadium is that they've made that a fortress. And yeah, the the annex, yeah, yeah. I think it's just just one of them. It is. It but, is uh, indeed. We'll so unfortunately. Yeah, unfortunately for Brighton and Leeds fans, there isn't yeah. much else we can say about that one. But... We do apologise for that. It's that curse of three o'clock kickoff rule. But yeah, we shall we shall move on. And... and moving on to the next one. So we've got Man City versus Crystal Palace. Now, this game was absolutely crazy for the neutral um, for a few reasons. Number one, Crystal Palace started absolutely on fire end up going 2-0 up in 21 minutes away to man city which is absolutely crazy and at this point everyone's thinking oh here we go the um title race is back on um if if, if crystal palace can hold out but the big word there is if yeah. and man city they're just one of those teams that just won't lie down and when you've got the players that they do and when they've brought in one man who we have to focus on. That Norwegian brand, robot. The ba- brand new Norwegian signing from Dortmund, Erling Haaland, who everyone thought there's a possibility that he might take time to adapt to the Premier League. Well, he's pretty much already adapted. He scored a hat-trick. He started off... Well, he didn't start off the comeback, but he... Bernardo Silva started off the comeback he at 2-1. The comeback. <laughs> Yeah, he he equalised for City in the 62nd minute. Then he got his second in the 70th minute. And then he rounded off his hat-trick in the 81st minute. Well, and for Crystal Palace fans, it's an absolute kick in the teeth. Because when your team is 2-0 up... Having I can a pretty third much... goal disallowed as well, which you know we'll come on to after talking about how well City played. Yeah, but... but um... You know, people can say what they want about Haaland's goals, the, the bar and the tappings, the this, the that. He's the man in the right position, and that's what you need. He's a number nine that just always seems to be in that position to score. It doesn't and matter in the slightest. How the goal how goes in doesn't scored. matter. It matters that it's a goal, and he scored three of them this game, taking his tally up to, I believe, six for the season. It's an absolute kick game. in the teeth for Crook. It's an absolute kick in the teeth for Crystal Palace fans, though, being 2 0 up. And I can guarantee you right now, any other, if they're playing any other team in the Premier League, and I generally mean this, any other team in the Premier League right now, this comeback does not happen. Man City just seem to be on another level. And primarily, traditionally, Man City start slow in the Premier League. And to be fair, they did. They did start slow in this game. They were 2 0 down. And it was the kick in the teeth that they needed. But when you have so much quality and abundance, you're talking about Bernardo Silva, Gundogan, Haaland, De Bruyne, Foden, Mares. Even with them losing players like Sterling, Jesus, Zinchenko, they've still got quality and abundance. That's why Pep Guardiola knew he doesn't need these players sitting on the bench room anymore. They can go and perform... Um, and regenerate their careers in other clubs such as Arsenal and Chelsea, etc. Because there's just so much quality around the Man City team. And it's not even a way that they like it's not like they go out um saying to a team, right, yeah, you'll score the first two goals because we know we're good enough to come back and score four. But it's just the swagger about them. It's just it's just inevitable at that point. I think everyone believed once City got one back then the floodgates would open, and they did. We've seen that against Newcastle as well when they went 3-1 down, and you just, you just knew that they only need one chance. And like I've always said, a two-goal lead is never a comfortable lead because once they get one, they're back in it. Oh, 100%. And I think you need a three-goal-plus lead against Man City. Oh, 100%. Um, 100%. Cause I, I, because I still genuinely believe if you give City five more minutes in that Newcastle game, they're probably winning that game. Yeah. They just left it a bit too late. But it's just it's just one of those, like, city of city. Do you know what I yeah. mean? They, they There's a reason they're this good. Number one, they've got an influx of money in abundance where they can sell, buy, whoever they want, really. They just, they just have that money there. 
Two, they've got one of the best managers in the world in Pep Guardiola who knows how to get the best out of players. He's got that team run like a well-oiled machine. There's no there's no weakness in that team. Whether you want to like, point Bernardo Silva playing as a six or if you want to point John Stones, even they're good enough to still be City players and play in them positions. I don't particularly think John Stones is a brilliant centre-back, but his career at City has proven that he's more than capable of hanging about the likes of uh, you know, Ruben Diaz and keeping Aymeric Laporte out of the City team, which oh, at one definitely. point no one thought could happen. Well, the crazy thing for me is I think because these defenders play for City and because you know, because the thing, as a football player... Because uh, you know you play for City, you'll know, you know you're going to have the ball as a team for 75-80% oh, yeah. of the game. And as a defender, you just, for a lot of it, you're just, you're, just, you're just ambling. Do you know what I mean? You're picking up the ball, you're passing it to De Bruyne, you might pass it back to you, you might not. And that's going to be your game for the next 30-40 minutes. Um, so as a, as, a, as a defender... I think you could put any defender in that city team and they will still switch off because it's just it's just second nature now for yeah. um it's, it's like become autopilot. like it's, it is it's, autopilot. Yeah. It, it, it's they, it seems to me that man city are, just don't mind conceding a couple of goals if they're gonna because they know they've got the ability to score it's like oh yeah, yeah you might score a couple of goals because our defense is a little weak and they're just not at the races because they don't have anything to do on on a basis, but we'll we've still got the firepower to put four, five, six past you. It's not a problem. Yeah. Shall we? Uh, shall we talk about the the controversy of that game? The handball, the, the disallowed third goal. Personally, I think it. it's silly to be disallowed. We we've seen these type of goals happen. You've seen it in the twenty eighteen Champions League final where Carriers has rolled the ball out and it's Benzema's put his foot in the way. And I just think it's Palace can feel aggrieved because I think it's three nil up. They've got that confidence. They probably put City to bed. I I I do agree with you, but I also I, see for me as a football fan these days because of how strong VAR is um, with obviously the big decisions now. And uh, let let's get it straight right now. I'm not a uh, an ambassador for VAR, I don't like it whatsoever. I think it's a terribly run um, thing right now. It needs a lot of changing up. But you've got to remember, at the end of the day, VAR right. might be exactly VAR might be electronic, but it's still ran by a human, and human error does happen. But in terms of the actual incident, I think another ref gives the goal. That ref didn't. That's yeah. it for me. Simply, there are. There's so many different times that things have happened in games where you could literally say, oh, if this guy's refing, he gives that. Do you know what I mean? And stuff like that. It's one of those where controversy will never, ever be taken out of football, no matter what. And sometimes it can hurt your team. Sometimes it can favour your team. Yeah. And on, and on in this occasion, it hurt Crystal Palace because, as you say, 3-0 is a good scoreline to have against City. Um, would City have come back from 3 0 down? Who knows? But when that goal was disallowed, that probably then gave City the kick up the arse they needed to then kick on because then in the second half they did kick on. Um, but as I say, for me, that's my take for it. It's a case of one ref gives it, one ref yeah. doesn't. I certainly think Palace can be aggrieved because we've seen in so many situations where. They've not been whistled and they've gone on to score. Like I say, you've seen it against um, Liverpool, Real Madrid. That goal was given and it's, you know, say what you want. If Eze kick, kicked the ball out of his hands, I've always thought the rule was once it's in one hand, well, as once as it's been rolled out, it's free game. Whether, yeah, you know, he's still true. got fucking a hand on it or not, I, I still think that goal should be given and I think it, it, it's harsh on Palace. It is the problem is for me they change the rules so much no one actually knows what the oh, rules oh, are it's anymore because ridiculous. They, used, it's... they used to just be like a set of rules like for example with that rule it used to be if you have if a keeper has two hands on the ball you can't touch it but if he only has one hand on the ball you could it's fair game. literally it's fair walk game. up 
Exactly. You could literally walk up to him, head the ball off his hands and put it in the back of the net, and that's a fair goal. So and we've seen that happen Ronaldinho. Before. Ronaldinho, yeah. I remember doing it yeah. to Julio yes. Cesar. Yeah. Yep. It's just one of them. Yep. But, yeah, uh, it's been happening in the Prem as well. Yeah. But, but like I say, it's just one of those where we just, people just don't know the rules anymore. Yeah. yeah, it's just one of them. The rules have been so twisted over the years. And exactly. there, so there's when, certain when... incidents that'll just bring up more discussion. This obviously being one of them, this will be discussed and the rule will probably be changed again. But we'll, we'll, we've said all a bit on it. We'll move on because we don't want this to be exponentially long. But yeah, that'll be it for the Man City Palace breakdown. Yep. And it's on to the game I have been so excited to talk about. Liverpool. Biased. Biased. Yeah, say what you want. I am a Liverpool fan. I did enjoy this watch. Liverpool, 9. Bournemouth, nil. I repeat, 9. Couldn't get double digits. I don't, th- I don't think that anyone's broke that record. I don't think it's ever been... This This matches no, no, the, the amount of goals in a game. Yeah. yeah. And this is this is a, a, a broken record for Liverpool in terms of matching that result in prim- first time in Premier League history week, but 9 past the team. But, um, poor Bournemouth. Yeah, poor Bournemouth. <laughs> Um, I, I do really feel for Bournemouth and it came out after the game that they had parted ways with Scott Parker which I think is an idiotic decision whether it be for bad results or he spoke out about the board I still think it's harsh cause... Oh it's 100% harsh but that's a different subject altogether yeah. Bournemouth really came into this game just damage limitations they knew we wanted a result after suffering against Manchester United and any reaction would have been a good reaction, never mind nine goals. Um, you know, we we started the scoring early on. Lewis Diaz, three minutes in, I think he had a you know a, an all round perfect performance, and I did not expect to see him score two headed goals. I think that that was more confusing out of than the actual nine nil. Um, but yeah, we, we just. We came in this game to blow Bournemouth away. I think, you know, Bournemouth were always going to struggle in this game. And I I, I want to mention two two players in general who I thought have A, a started the season well and B are just going to be some talents in the future. That's Harvey Elliott and Fabio Cavallo. You know, Elliott took his goal fantastically in the six minutes. Scoring his first goal at Anfield in the Premier League, and Fabio Cavallo, great finish. Uh, second, uh, second last goal scored the eighth. Surprisingly, a harder finish than the one he had against United. He takes this one. Technique is be- uh, beautiful, and just it was an all-round perfect response to losing to Man United. Do you wanna? Do you wanna add your bit? Yeah, so don't have too much to say on this. Obviously, the result really does speak for itself. I mean, it was always going to be tough for Bournemouth. And it's like I've said before, when you're playing against Liverpool, you have to just frustrate them. And when you concede in three minutes, you're just asking for danger at that point. Because when Liverpool don't score early, they really struggle they they create chances but they seem to frustrate themselves with not scoring early because they know how good they are they know they should be blowing teams away like this yeah. on the daily not not nine nil but um but as i say when you concede early against liverpool you are asking for trouble because then if you do have a plan of action which bournemouth probably did they probably trained all week working hard and they had a plan of action how to frustrate liverpool for as long as physically possible and the, it just didn't go their way. And they yeah. seeded, obviously, in the third minute. And then your plan goes out of the window at that point. And then Bournemouth have to throw away their plan. And they have to come out of the shape that they had worked on all week. And then that just opens gaps. Yeah. And then when you when you open gaps against a team like Liverpool, they're going to punish you because they have the quality and abundance to do so. And that's exactly what they did. I also don't and think I... anyone expected, especially Bournemouth, like, you know, teams know how good Roberto Firmino is. And, you know, no one expected that level of performance. Three assists within, I think, 30 minutes. Oh, yeah. Uh, was just, you know, F- Firmino was the Firmino of old. He he was amazing in this game. He, he, he like, 
if he can perform like that week in, week out, it's going to be hard to displace him from this team. And it was well, that's, that's the type of player Firmino's always been, though. When Liverpool first signed him, you saw straight away he wasn't an out and out goal scorer number nine. He was a player that would happily roll into the 10 and assist players like Mo Salah and Mane to give them the the limelight. Like that's just, just a player for me, anyways. He works hard up and down the pitch. Yeah. It's just when it comes down to it, he plays in a number nine, but he just doesn't play like a number nine. And that's always been the criticism with Firmino because when you play as a number nine, you have to score goals on a regular basis to be like an Erling Haaland, for example. You'll never see him tracking back 80 yards, but he'll put in three goals for you. At the end of the day, fans would much rather see three goals in the back of the net than a player that will run his socks off for 90 minutes, which is unfortunate because Firmino does work hard for me. I'll never say a bad word against Firmino. Sometimes he makes bad decisions um, with his passing and stuff like that. But when he's on, he's on. And he's a fantastic talent. That's why he's still gets into the Brazil team and yeah. the Brazil squad because he's a talent at the end yeah. of the day. I think, but he just well, doesn't play as a number nine. When Firmino's on his game, he is indispensable to this Liverpool team because as much as you know, he gets the criticism for not being the number nine that scores goals. He does so much work outside of being that number nine. We've always known that Firmino has never been the twenty thirty goal a season striker that we probably would have liked. But yeah. we've always accepted that this man will do more for this. That man would die for this club. And we've seen it time and time again. The work he puts in, the tracking back, the coming deep, picking out holes in defence. Like, there's been so many times where he's been the catalyst to a win just because of how hard he works, how much he presses, how much he's tracking back. Because we know... Salah and Mane are never going to be the ones that run 30 yards backwards to put a tackle on. Whereas, you know, Firmino, while he probably shouldn't run 30 yards backwards because it leaves that hole in the number nine, he's always there when we need him. But that's he... exactly that's exactly why, though, that Liverpool fans said goodbye to Mane. Because... Yeah. I guarantee that the decision was between Manny and Firmino, and the reason Firmino is still a Liverpool player is exactly those reasons you've to, just pointed out. To be fair, it was between Salah or Mane. We we offered Salah the contract, not Mane. I bet. I bet Firmino was also in discussion, though. His contract comes at uh, comes ends at the end of this season, so this could be his last season in a Liverpool shirt, which would absolutely break my heart because I love this man. Possibly. But, but uh, as I say, the result speaks for itself. Yeah. Um, Massive reaction after the, the loss at Old Trafford. And I just feel for Bournemouth, they were always going to be up against it this game. They were going to come down field, a, a fired up and field against a fired up team. It's always going to it's gonna be tough for them all yeah. season, as you say, especially with them setting, sacking Scotty Park. And now they're just asking for trouble. Mm. I mean, just speaking from... Um, a betting perspective for all you betters out there. I, w- I work in a bookies and the odds went from um, evens for Bournemouth to be relegated to now one to three. So it's massively swung pendulum wise to Bournemouth are basically already saying hello to the championship in terms of betting wise. Yeah. So it's looking bleak for Bournemouth. They, re- they really need to back whoever comes in next. And I don't think, you know, sacking a manager after four games, whether he spoke out about the club not backing him or whether it's because of poor results, you know, p- playing three of probably the best informed teams at the moment in Liverpool, Arsenal, City, they were never going to pick up points in any of them three games. Well, one thing one thing I will say, and I was, I was going to save this for our transfer episode, but I want to actually put this out now, is... If they've sacked Scott Parker because of this result, that is the most idiotic, stupid thing I've ever heard in my life because there's a certain manager called Ralph Hasenhutl who lost 9-0 when he first took over Southampton and he's still the manager today. And now look what he's doing with Southampton. He suffered two 9-0 losses, if you remember. Exactly. My point exactly. My point exactly. But we'll move on anyway. We'll we'll move on. All I can say is up the Reds. What What a response. Biased. <laughs> <laughs> I can be biased all I want. We needed this result. We, we desperately needed a reaction, but we shall move on. And it is on to, I believe, the last of the three o'clock kickoffs. Is it? 
Yes, it is. It is. So this is Brentford Everton. Can't really comment much on my side. Uh, I will say that from what I have seen, Gordon took his goal very well. And it was left to an 84 minute, 84th minute equaliser from Janelle's save a point for Brentford. So, so. Yes, like, likewise, can't really say too much on the game as it was another three o'clock kickoff. From what I was hearing again on uh, Soccer Saturday, um, they were frustrating Brentford massively, Everton. They obviously got the early goal and they started off the stronger team. Then in the second half, Brentford really came into it. And uh, on another day, this finishes 3-4-1 Brentford. Um, apparently, a couple of standout performers um, was Connor Cody, the new signing for Everton, which I knew he would be. He was a good defender at Wolves. He's going to ensure that that defence stays solid. And there are leaders in this Everton team with Tarkovsky, Cody, Pickford. So they have um, leaders. So it doesn't surprise me that Everton can pick up results like this um, and frustrate teams. They might be a, an, another one of those teams that will just frustrate teams. They won't look like that uh, explosive Everton that we've come to know. They'll be one of those teams now that are just going to frustrate teams and pick up points here and there under Frank Lampard. Um, but yeah, Cody and Tarkovsky, um, um, both stand up performers. Same with Pickford as well. We we know what Pickford can do. It's um, he's a good goalkeeper. He just makes he's just got a mistake in him. Um, yeah. But as I say, they frustrated Brentford. Um, as as I say, on another day, Brentford could have scored three or four. It just couldn't get the ball in the back of the net um, because they pretty much dominated the entire second half. Brentford, from what I heard, and just looked at the stats, that was the case. Um, fifty-eight percent possession, twenty um shots, shots from Brentford, but only five on target. In the second half, they had sixty-seven percent possession, and they had eleven shots on target uh, on goal. Sorry, but only three on target. So maybe a lack of cutting edge as well on the Brentford side, but the Everton defence standing firm and a good point away at Brentford because Brentford aren't easy to get anything from, especially um at home for Brentford. Yeah. So good result for Everton that for me. And Brentford will feel a little aggrieved, but on another day, as I say, they could have put three or four past Pickford. Yeah. I think that's always been the biggest talking point with Everton is whether they can keep the goals out and today uh, they, they they did for this game. Yes, and as, as as I say, they have leaders in that back line with Cody and Tarkovsky. Like yeah. people, people thought, why are Everton signing Connor Cody? These are the reasons why they sign in Connor Cody. He is going to demand from not just his defense, but his midfield in front of him as well to protect him and Tarkovsky. And they're going to put their body on the line to keep the ball out of the back of the net. They might not be the quickest, the, the strongest. They might not be the most. Um, tactically gifted on the ball to be able to play out from the back um to be able to play the way maybe Frank Lampard wants to play but at the end of the day their job is to keep the ball out of the back of the net and other than the one goal they conceded late on they did do that mm. and when, think... when a team is when a team um sorry for cutting you off That's but um when, when a team is pressing like Brentford did and when they were dominating so much it is inevitable that you can't keep them out forever unfortunately um and that's why Everton have to settle for a point here. But I think it's a, a point that Everton fans will be happy with. Yeah. I even think, though it was a late equaliser. I think as well, the, the question mark why they signed Conor Cordy is that defence is, like you say, incredibly slow. It's not mobile. And if they do want to play at a five-back like they did set up against Brentford, yeah, one, one of them of the two, two slow boys is going to have to play as a, a wide centre-back, which you're always going to get joy whether you know the, the the intelligent kind that know where to put the body when when to dive in, if you, you come up against the side that uses its pace, if you come up against the City, a Liverpool, uh, a Chelsea who have Sterling who's extremely quick, or an Arsenal who like to break, there's going to be very big holes in in that uh, Everton back line, especially with how slow them two are. Oh yeah, there definitely is, but like I say that. You can being slow. It doesn't mean you're um, a bad defender and you can't work in the Premier League. It just means that you need to be on the ball a lot more than say a Van Dyke 
because his pace gets him out of troublesome situations with the way it looks like the Ev- Everton want to play Tarkovsky is going to cover Cody and Cody's going to cover Tarkovsky basically yeah. and same with Mason Holgate you know what I mean they're going to cover each other and that's what you've got to do the the way where Everton is at the minute they're just going to have to work hard for each other and it's going to come down to their results are going to come down to just them working hard it's not going to be about quality it's going to just going to be about grit and determination right now until they can start bringing in bigger players that are gonna be explosive for them again it's for me it's another rebuilding process at Everton um but they're going to give teams games at the start of the season I I worried for Everton but from what I've seen so far with um especially with their defense they're going to be tough so that's good in for yeah. Everton fans I just think it's one of them it always seems to be a rebuild rebuilding uh it always seems to be a rebuild at Everton they always have of players signing always letting go of big players. I say again that Allen didn't start, whether that's, you know, an issue with him in training, if he's not performing. I think he, he's a midfielder that you always need in your team if you want to play a five. Yeah. Well they've got they've got a lot of big players to come back, Evan. They've got Calvert Lewin, Decore, Gomez, Mina. These are four big, big players for Everton that make them explosive. Um so right now if I'm an Everton fan, I'm just looking at it, go. Just keep picking up points. Just keep p- picking up points where we can. Keep working hard, my team. And then when these players come back, that's when I want to see them then kick on. Um, and hopefully that will be the case for Everton fans. And maybe they can get a couple of bodies in before the deadline. But we shall see. But as I say, good point for Everton and frustrating for for Brentford. Yep, indeed. We shall we shall, we shall move on. Do it. And now moving on to the final game of the Saturday fixtures. We have Arsenal and Fulham, and it's a 2-1 win at the Emirates for Arsenal. But it is not that straightforward as everyone expected it to be. Um, I personally watched this game, and first off, I want to give props to Fulham in that first half. They were absolutely brilliant. They really frustrated Arsenal. Arsenal played well, don't get me wrong. They They've played very well at the start of this season. Um, again, the players that they've brought in um, have still been doing the bits for them that they expect to do. They have a grit and determination about them, Arsenal, that they're not going to um, drop down to where everyone expects them to be. Um, may, maybe um, exceeding expectations, but um, in this game, they started off well, Arsenal. They were um, controlling the ball. Um, but Fulham had a plan, and their plan did work well. Um, they were frustrating Arsenal in the right areas in around the 20-yard mark. Arsenal couldn't really get anything going. One player I do want to pick out, though, that was an absolute superstar was Martin Odegaard. This guy ran the game. And when I say he ran the game, I mean there was nothing Arsenal did without him having an input in it. This guy was ridiculous. He was getting back, winning tackles for his team, winning the ball back. He was absolutely everywhere on Saturday evening. Martin Odegaard is an absolute talent for Arsenal. And I can see why he's been given the captain's armband by Mikel Arteta. Because this guy is a superstar. Straightforward. He is Arsenal's main man for me. I know they signed Gabriel Jesus and they've got Martinelli. um, But Martin Odegaard runs the team for Arsenal. But get it to half time and it's still nil nil. So Arsenal uh, will feel a bit aggrieved because they did play well in the first half. They created chances, but nothing really crazy. Jesus had a one on one that he couldn't put away, um, which was their best chance of the first half. But then we come to the second half and Fulham come out and they absolutely came out flying at Arsenal. Arsenal were probably still in the changing rooms for the first 20 minutes. And so led to the first goal, which was a complete mistake from Gabriel. He's usually been an absolute rock for Arsenal, but he did make a mistake. So um, if you haven't seen the game, I'll walk you through what happened. So basically, absolutely no pressure whatsoever from Fulham. The ball's with Ramsdale. Easy pass out from the goal kick. And Gabriel just takes too many touches on the ball. He tries to turn Mitrovic, who is has begun to press him um, and he just turns basically into trouble and the ball gets nicked from Mitrovic and then he's just got the easy 
um, job to do to just put the ball in the back of the net against Ransdale when he does it exactly how Fulham fans expect Mitrovic to do. Um, and I will say that was, I believe, Mitrovic's 100th goal for... Um, I don't know if it was his 100th goal for Fulham or was it his 100th go- career goal? It was it was some milestone for Mitrovic anyway. For Fulham. 100 goals in 181 games, which is a ridiculous record. He just needs to yeah. get it more. <laughs> yeah, it is crazy. But once again, I get to that point where I've probably said it in every podcast now, but this is what Fulham need is Mitrovic to put goals in the back, uh, balls in the back of the net, sorry. And that's exactly what he did. Yeah, a big mistake from Gabriel. Um, but he does rectify that, but we'll come on to that. Um, so Fulham take the lead, which is absolutely fantastic. But then we come to that main man again, Martin Odegaard. Um, he's just started the season on absolute fire, not just with him controlling the game, but the goals he's scoring as well. I will say it was a shot from the edge of the box that did take a hefty deflection that led to the equaliser for Arsenal. But sometimes you need that little bit of luck going your way and Arsenal seem to have not just the luck but the performances at the minute as well um, so Martin Odegaard does get his goal which levels up the game 1-0 and from this point on it was pretty much the Arsenal show um, they pretty much dominated the game from there Fulham had a couple of chances on the breakaway but um, there wasn't really anything to speak of there was one moment where um one of their players, Cabano, he um, is a very quick guy and he had a breakaway. And if he just, if he plays a pass two seconds earlier, it probably gets through to um, Mitrovic and he's one-on-one with Ramsdale, but he chooses not to make the pass and he tries to take on the final defender rather um, passing it across to Mitrovic. If, if that's different, maybe Fulham go 2-1 up at that point, but chance not taken and then the 86th minute um Arsenal had a string of corners back to back and Gabri- um, Gabriel Martinelli pretty much the whole game couldn't put in a good corner for Arsenal but the one time he puts in a fantastic delivery um there was a melee in the box you got four players jumping up for the header it drops to um Gabriel who's just got the easy um, opportunity to just stick his foot on it and put the ball in the back of the net, which from one comes Gabriel from... to another. Yes, pretty much, and it was um, it turned him from the villain to the hero at the Emirates, and um, that's exactly how it finished two one to Arsenal. Um, that's pretty much the rundown of the whole game that I saw. What I will say is Fulham did play well. Um, I personally believe they deserve to come away with a point at the Emirates, but. At the end of the day, Arsenal are on a, a rich vein of form at the minute and they just seem to be able to not just dominate games, but also nick three points when they need to at the minute. So it was a good performance from Arsenal, though. And as I say, standout performer and man of the match easily for me was Martin Odegaard. This guy absolutely ran the game. Started to take on that role of what Ozil used to do when he was at Arsenal. He just needs to keep that up. Oh, yeah, but... If we're comparing Martin Odegaard to Ozil, there's a complete difference in a good way for Martin Odegaard, which is Martin Odegaard's happily to sprint back 70 yards and win the ball back. Yeah, Ozil 100%. never did that. Ozil sat in the 10 and did nothing. Um, but Martin Odegaard is something else. He's got the captain's armband. He's got the uh, bit between his teeth. This guy's a talent. He works hard and he gets rewarded for working hard as well. Yeah. But we uh we shall we shall move on. Brilliant result for Arsenal. They sit top of the league with with that. Indeed. But we shall move on. And it is on to the first of the two early kickoffs on Sunday. It is Wolves versus Newcastle. Uh, Newcastle left it late, but what a strike by Alan St Maximin. Maximan. Maximin, Maximan, same thing. Uh, Proven that, you know, he does have that M product that was questioned of him. And he has kept it up. Yeah, um, it's unfortunate for Wolves. They um, started the game well. Um, 
eventually taking the lead in the 38th minute for Ruben Neves. Another lovely goal from Ruben Neves. As per usual, you don't really see Ruben Neves scoring tap-ins. Um, I think it's impossible for him to score a tap-in. It probably is, that. to be honest. Um, and yeah, right on the 90th minute, a big result for Newcastle, because even though they've started well, they would have wanted to come away here with something, which they eventually did. And then by the end of the game, they, they could have won the game. They had two really good chances after St. Maximan equalizers for them in the 93rd and the 96th minute, I believe, because there was, I think it was 99 minutes. The game for, lasted in, in the end, maybe maybe even longer. I'm not sure. But um, um, it was a long, it was a long, long. Um, so Wolves fans would have been biting their nails at this point because the last 10, 15 minutes or so was all Newcastle, maybe the last 20 minutes. It was 100 um, minutes. The match lasted yeah, 10 minutes at yeah. the time. There you go. Um, but yeah, so Newcastle would have been happy to come away with a point, maybe a little aggrieved to not have all three points. As I said, they had two very good chances at the end, just didn't just didn't work out for them, unfortunately. But a good, good point for both teams, I'd say. Fair result on the whole balance of things. Um, I think Wolves um, have good players. They have a good team. But um, for me, they just, they're just they lacking cutting edge still for me. Um, obviously, taking the lead for Ruben Neves, but that's your midfielder. He's not really meant to get you all the goals. It's obviously great when midfielders do chip in. Um, but yeah, from, there isn't really too much to talk about this game from, from my perspective, other than a good result for both teams. Keeps them ticking over in the Premier League. Obviously, Wolves being at home would have preferred to pick up all three points, but they were very close to doing so. But Newcastle under Eddie Howe seem to have just something about them at the minute that they just won't lie down for anyone. I mean, yeah. you saw that in you saw that in the City game. Mm, so this wasn't surprised, surprising to me in the slightest. When I looked at this fixture, if it would have been Newcastle at home, I would have seen them picking up all three points. But I saw this as a draw as soon as I saw the fixture on Sunday. And that's exactly what happened. Yeah. I can't really comment much. I think I don't think this was the televised two o'clock kickoff. It was. Oh, it was? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I thought the other game was the televised one. No. Nope. <laughs> My bad. My bad. It, it it continuously confuses me seeing Joel Linton as a, the midfielder in that team, but he's he's slowly become such a an asset in that uh, in that midfield. You know, he, oh, he yeah, uses this big stature, good. and you know he's just he he's properly turned his career around it. Newcastle, as you know, he was he came to Newcastle as this big forty million pound striker, and he's. Obviously, he didn't really fit the billet striker, and he's just he he's used, bit been used as a midfielder, and it it certainly turned his fortunes on for the better. And Newcastle have an extra body in midfield. Oh, definitely. I mean, Eddie Howe played in there because he absolutely had to, but then he's worked on him with it, obviously, over the summer, and he looks like an absolute revelation in midfield. I mean, he's got all the attributes to be a good midfielder he's aggressive he's strong he's quick he can pick a pass and he can also put the ball in the back of the net as well i mean what more can you ask for from a midfielder so i don't think you can ask for much more so props to eddie howe for that a lovely great bit of management yeah um but yeah as i say good point for both teams yeah we shall we shall move on to the last two o'clock kickoff Okay, yeah, moving on to the other two o'clock kickoff, we have my beloved West Ham United away to Aston Villa and us West Ham actually picking up their first points of the season, the first goal of the season and the first points of the season. Now, I am going to be absolutely unbiased here right now because I could come out and say what a result for West Ham, which it was great result for West Ham. But any West Ham fan will tell you we was terrible. We deserved absolutely nothing from this game and we ended up coming away with all three points. So right now, if you did watch the game, Villa fans, you've got to be very aggrieved if you did see the game because we pretty much got dominated for most of it. Um, 
What I will say, though, is um, it was the first time that Skamaka had started a Premier League game for West Ham. And it's nothing to do with Skamaka whatsoever. I still think he'll be a great signing for us. But the tactics just did not work from David Moyes in the first half. And he knew that because we got absolutely dominated. We should have been 2 3 nil down at half time. He tried to play a five at the back. Um, he tried to use Creswell as a makeshift centre back again. And this guy, it just, it just doesn't work. Kera and Zuma, fantastic defenders. They're the reason we went in at nil nil. Um, Declan Rice looked like his old self again, which is one good plus for West Ham fans because for the first few games, he's kind of been on his jolly, still on his summer jollies. Um, but you can't keep this player down for long. Um, Socek did play well. Um, but again, it was one of those where we pretty much got dominated in the first half. Um, but then we get to the second half. He gets a minute half time and he does change the... Um, system. He takes off Emerson, goes back to a back four, and he brings on Saeed Ben Rama. And this is a guy who shouldn't have been on the bench from the start. And I think David Moyes now realizes that because he changed the game pretty much, Ben Rama, when he came on. Um, we did look a bit better in terms of possession. We looked a bit stronger going forward. Skamaka had a couple of half chances, shall we say. Um, but then the old West Ham came back where Skamaka comes off in the 65th minute and Antonio comes on. And you, you just know what you're going to get from this guy. You're going to get, he's going to cause centre backs and defenders all sorts of trouble. He's going to run the channel. He's strong. He's quick. He can win headers. He's going to hold up the ball, which makes it so much easier for our creative players like Fornals to get involved in the game. And that's exactly where our goal came from. Um, a hold-up ball from Mikel Antonio played to Declan Rice, who then plays it on the edge of the box to Pablo Fornells, who finds the bottom corner with it. I can't remember if it took a deflection or not. I did watch the highlights, but I can't actually remember if it took a deflection. But yeah, we then take the lead um, completely against the run of play because um, Villa did not play bad in this game whatsoever. They, Like I said, they were unlucky not to not go in at 3-0 up at half time. Um, I think it was an absolute wake-up call for West Ham. But it's one of those where at the end of the day we picked up the three points. So from a West Ham perspective, happy to pick up the three points. So very much needed. But I look at the the whole game as a scheme of things as a football fan because as we know, one result doesn't mean that the next one's going to come so easy. If you're performing bad in one game and winning, it doesn't mean you're going to perform bad every game and win them. So I always look at the performance rather than the result as well. And it's a bit worrying as a West Ham fan, but I do think we're he's integrating new things, new players into the team. Everyone's getting used to how everyone's going to play. I think it will come good for West Ham, but it's a very slow start. But three points on the board. Yeah, it'll be a, it'll be a big three points as well. It's your first three points of the season. And that... Hopefully, he'll spare you on in uh, further results and further fixtures. Hopefully so. Hopefully so. I do think that will be the catalyst for it. Um, three points can sometimes be the catalyst for mm. your season to kick off. You just need that little bit of luck. And we needed a lot of luck in this game because, as I said, we was appalling in the first half. Um, I, was, I obviously couldn't watch the game because it wasn't live. I was at work. But I was looking at the stats and for... The first 35 minutes, I think Villa had 75% possession. Jesus. And that doesn't happen against West Ham. We're usually much more grittier than that. But like I say, kicking the teeth that was needed, hopefully, and we can kick on from, yeah. What I will say is as well, from what I've heard from Villa fans who have seen the game and throughout the entire season, that Villa don't seem to have a, you know, a set formation. a set they, they, they don't seem to have any tactics that they go to. It always seems to be a different eleven, different lineup, different system formation each game. I do, and... I do agree. With, I do agree with that. But as I say, on another day, they could have been three 0 up at half yeah. time. Though Just that and... cutting edge was missing from Molly Watkins and Danny Ings. Pretty much. Pretty yeah. much. Yeah. But, uh, pretty much. We shall move on to the last game of the week. Yes. And into the last game of 
game week four, I believe this is. It's yes, is Forest versus Tottenham. Tottenham come away two nil will it, uh, winners, courtesy of two Harry Kane goals. Um, they do. I'll let you take some of this because I, like I said, I didn't get to watch. The, I didn't get to watch the game. But yes, yeah, uh, so I want. I watched a, a large portion of this game, and what I will say, um, obviously, it's a great result for Tottenham doing what they need to do, really. I mean, a Tottenham should be beating a just-promoted team, no matter who they are, no matter how many signings they've made, uh, no matter how good they've looked at the start of the season. But I will say, Forrest did play very well in this game. Um, they frustrated Tottenham for large portions of it. Obviously, they got the worst start possible. They um, uh, a lack of concentration at the back led to a Harry Kane opener in five minutes. But right after that, I mean, a lot of teams would have crumbled and um, come out of shape and lost 2 3 4 nil to Tottenham. But Nottingham Forest did not do that whatsoever. They they battled hard. They made chances for themselves. They just, again, that lacking cutting edge that we always speak about, but it's so needed in the Premier League. I mean, goals win you games and get you points that's just the way it goes it doesn't matter how well you play if you don't put the ball in the back of the net you are going to struggle to um pick up anything in the Premier yeah. League that's just the way it goes and when Tottenham have a player like Harry Kane in their team that only needs one chance to put the ball in the back of the net that's what he's going to do um then like I said Forrest did play well um the second half they did um, give away a penalty. Uh, I want to speak on that, that that a little bit. It was the longest VAR um, check I've seen all season so far, and it was so straightforward. It's unreal. It was literally a crossed ball, and um, Cook literally saves it off the line as Harry Kane's about to head it in. He literally tips it over the bar with his hand. I don't know why VAR needs to only should they should have looked, just looked at it once. Should um, they should then check if that's a red card because I see he didn't get sent off and that's denying well, the goal scoring opportunity. Well, yeah, I think that's why it took so long because they was also just they were just also checking whether um, the build up was offside mm. and stuff like this. Which is, okay, I understand that, but they literally I think looked at it about twenty different times. And at this point, the Tottenham fans didn't even know if a penalty was going to get given. Um, but it was clear and obvious that it was a penalty. And for me, it should have been a straight red card because if his hand isn't, if his hand doesn't tip it over the bar, Harry Kane, I think, would get his head to it and would put it in the back of the net. It would have been close. I think that's why he got away with it. I think because the ball was so high, it was literally right near the crossbar and Harry Kane's not quite off the ground yet. If Harry Kane's already in the air as they're looking at this clip and can see that Harry Kane's just got an easy tap in, he gets straight red carded. I think it literally only saved Stephen Cook because the ball was so high and Harry Kane hadn't yet got off the ground. Yeah. But either way, penalty gets given. Harry Kane steps up. Everyone thinks it's inevitable, but Nottingham Forest have made a fantastic signing in Dean Henderson. Yeah, he's been brilliant this season. I heard he had a blight. Despite the two goals, I heard he was phenomenal. He was. He literally was. He kept the result low for Forrest. Yeah. Um, because even though Forrest played well, Tottenham did create a lot of chances because the way Forrest want to play at the minute, they want to play expansive football, which does leave gaps against these big teams. Um, but they trust their goalkeeper in Dean Henderson, and rightly so. Um, saves the penalty against Harry Kane, who wasn't a terrible penalty at all. He hit it hard low, look, arrowed right into the bottom corner, just Henderson dived the right way and got there. Um, but even though uh, Nottingham Forest were trying to push for that equaliser, they had a few chances in the second half. But in the 81st minute, um, Richarlison had come on at this point and he sets up Harry Kane for another tap in with his head. He seems to score a lot of goals with his head at the minute, Harry Kane. Mm. Um, but that's just what you get. Uh, I think Harry Kane had three chances and he put two in, the two goals he scored and the penalty miss. Other than that, I don't think Harry Kane really had many other chances. Um, a few fell to Sun, a couple to Kulishevsky, but Dean Henderson was on form to save them. But for me, it was one of those where uh, on another day, Tottenham scored, could have scored five or six. Um, but also on another day, Forrest could have drew this game 2-2. Yeah. It was just one of those games for Forrest. Um, 
But these aren't the games Forest are expected to win for me anyway. Oh, no. no and no. Um, these are the games Tottenham are expected to win. And they did exactly that. So props to Tottenham. Three points on the board again. Uh, still got no worries over Forest whatsoever. Um, as I said, they did play well in this game. I they did battle they hard. Oh, 100%. 100%. There's no doubt in my mind about that. Um, but yeah, for me, just the lack of cutting edge and um, quality on the other side of the pitch from Tottenham, which you expect to get from the likes of Harry Kane and Son and Kuliszewski, Richarlison, etc. Yeah, 100%. So spot on. Spot on, spot on indeed. And that wraps up the the weekend fixtures. Yes, that is going to do it, guys. Thank you so much for listening or watching whatever you guys are um, doing. I don't know if you actually watch just to see the pictures change. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's been, it's been a good one, guys. A lot of interesting results this week. Obviously, you had the 9-0 from Liverpool. You had the comeback from Man City. You had the... 10 men of Chelsea holding on uh, and West Ham picking up their first points of the season. Um, so it's on to game week. The midweek fixtures, aren't there? Y- yes, the midweek fixtures. See how everyone gets on there. Obviously, games are coming thick and fast now um, with the lead up to the World Cup in November. Obviously, got the, the Champions League also starting soon as well and the Europa League. So that's all exciting as well. Teams have got to be very careful with what players they use and when um but yeah that's going to do it guys thank you so much for watching make sure if you did enjoy it make sure to like and subscribe for all future content we try to get this podcast out every week to keep up to date with all the fixtures um and uh, we hope you enjoyed it guys we will we will see you for another week of premier league fixtures Absolutely. Take it easy, guys. Peace.